All right, so thank you guys for joining in. Uh, so my name is Grace, and I am part of the Fulbright Cree Alumni Relations Committee, and I will serve as your moderator today. Um, so today's webinar will focus on steps taken to get into the international education field and um, how to stay competitive with the job opportunities. So we'll start off with Heather and Tyler. If you guys could just introduce yourself with your experiences in international education and what you're doing right now at Georgia State. Why don't you start, Tyler? All right, well, my name is Tyler Askew, so I work here at Georgia State as an international student advisor, um, so in our international student and scholar services. So I work with um, international students who have come to the U.S. on um, a student visa and are studying here at Georgia State. Um, prior to this, I, um, I was a Fulbrighter myself. I was a ETA in Hungary, in Budapest. Um, I guess that was maybe th three or four years ago at this point. Um, after finishing my Fulbright, I went to Emory and got a master's degree in theology, theological studies. And my name is Heather Housley, and I am very proud to be the director of International Student and Scholar Services here at Georgia State. I have been at the university for over 18 years, and of course I started when I was 15, right? <laughs> but uh, my path is a little different, so after undergrad, I went off to the Peace Corps and served in the Peace Corps for two years in Senegal and then uh, decided that I knew I wanted to work in the higher education setting. I wanted to work with students and so I learned more about the field of um, higher education and student affairs and, and learned about these master's programs that you can get in various places. So ended up at Ohio State in their higher ed and student affairs program, got my master's decided I wanted to work with international students specifically, um, studied abroad while I was there in India, and then came to Georgia State first in international admissions, and then quickly moved over to the international student office, and I have been here ever since. Um, but along the way, I have had two Fulbright programs. Um, I was selected for the International Education Administrators uh, Seminar first in Germany, and then, um, I guess about five years ago, I also was able to go on the International Education Administrator Seminar to India. So two Fulbrights, and um, I also serve as the faculty and staff Fulbright liaison for the university, advising them on how to apply for Fulbrights. Thank you, Heather and Tyler. So I know you guys have a lot of experience with Fulbright. So thank. Thank you again for just um, taking the time to meet with us and just to talk to us about your experiences. Um, so before we get started with the questions, the ETAs, if you could introduce yourself with your name and why you're interested in the field of international education and if you have previous experience that you want to share. Who starts? <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Nikki. I am an ETA in Jeonju, South Korea. And I am originally from a little town called Walla Walla, Washington. I did my master's degree in international studies at the University of Washington. And um, I became interested in working with international students there because I was working with Japanese business students. And um, just being here in Korea has really fueled that interest in continuing on in the international education field. Next. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Uh, hi, my name is Kathleen. Um, I'm a second year ETA in um, Mokpo, South Korea. And before coming to Korea, I was working as a program manager with um, adult education programs at a um, community literacy council in North Carolina. Um, so I worked with some international students there, and I've enjoyed working with my students here, like directly working with students. Um, and while I've discovered that I don't want to be in the classroom, I would really um, like to work with students still one-on-one, -on -one, um, maybe back in the States. I guess I'll go. 
my name is Preston. Um, I'm a second year ETA as well. Um, in college, I have experience working with international students because I did a lot of tutoring and I also studied abroad in Korea in the past. So I helped some of my Korean friends apply to study in America. And they're currently studying in the U.S. right now. And I've also realized that I don't really like teaching in the classroom, but I really love working with international students, so I'd really like to get more involved with that. Hi, my name is Coral. Um, I'm teaching in Hadong, which is in the south part of South Korea. Um, I know that I'm interested in education, and I have a lot of international experience kind of outside of education, um, studying abroad and same thing, working with students as a tutor. And so I kind of just wanted to see like what kind of opportunities there were that matched those two interests together. Kelsey, we can't hear you. <laughs> so sorry. So you are welcome to type in the chat. Um, so while she is typing, I'm assuming someone else, or Aaron, if you want to introduce yourself, or Taylor. Hi, can everyone hear me? OK. Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm a second year ETA. Um, after college, I did a year of service with City Year, um, and then worked in an educational nonprofit in Boston for a year uh, before coming to Korea. So I'm very interested in working with students outside the classroom and exploring different options for how I can do that. And Taylor, we cannot hear you either. So Taylor, you are welcome to, in the meantime, too, to type um, your intro into the chat. Sorry, you guys, for the technical difficulties. Um, so while you guys are typing, we can go ahead and get started with the questions. And then um, I will say your chat just to make sure that everyone knows your introductions. So with the first question, um, so there, you guys had a lot of great questions. So for time's sake, I'm just going to ask the first question that you guys um, submitted to me. And then if we have time to answer the second question. Um, so the first question is from Coral, and it is directly for Tyler. And she was asking, what was your career path from your Fulbright role to current role, which you kind of did talk about? Right. So I, um, I studied philosophy as an undergraduate. Um, I, I was at Wake Forest, studied philosophy and religion, um, and then decided that you know, I really I loved all things international. I really wanted to get out of the States, really wanted to get out of kind of the cultural bubble that I'd grown up in. Um, and so that's what took me to Hungary. Um, and I taught as a, as a teaching assistant at a, at a university level, so I was interacting with college students. Um, and I just loved the university, university environment. Um, and I knew that I had a lot of intellectual questions that were still out there to be, to be pursued, and so I decided I wanted to go to, to graduate school to study theology. And part of that was you know, to determine what trajectory I wanted to, to go on, whether or not I wanted to go PhD, or to kind of to what, in what ways I wanted to continue to be in education. Um, and you know, after finishing that degree, I decided that I, I really wanted something a little bit more practical, um, where I was interacting with people on a on a day to day basis and not so exclusively in the theoretical, um, which was I think one one option in a university. Um, and so I found that international, you know, inter interacting with international students and international education is a place where a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different ideas are coming together. So I thought that was a a good practical location to have those kinds of conversations and have those kinds of interactions. Um, so for me, it was, you know, full undergraduate Fulbright, um, a master's degree in a field that was not really specifically related to international education, um, and the decision to move toward international education um, as a career field after that. Tyler, how did your ETA enable you to get into grad programs? Did it help? I'm sure it did. I mean, I think that um, having had the the experiences, you know, abroad, and having had the uh, you know ability to learning to negotiate different perspectives. I mean, as a, a theology student, you're having to 
to study a lot of different worldviews. And so I think the, the practical applications of that um, and the teaching aspects of having been in the classroom um, and trying to lead discussions and trying to um, figure out ways to convey complicated ideas um, to students who were unfamiliar with them um, or in a, you know, in a language they weren't as, as readily able to, to speak about complex things. Uh, I think those skills were really valuable. Thank you, Tyler, for sharing your insight. And then before I ask the next question, I'll go ahead and share Kelsey's um, bio. So her name's Kelsey, and she lives in Ilkson, South Korea. Um, she's worked with she's worked with a soft landing program that brought international students into her university and gave them traditional courses in EFL. Um, she's also worked with the English program for adults in her community. Um, she loves being in the classroom and working directly with students, future teachers, and current teachers. And Taylor is interested in the webinar um, because she's lucky to have had a lot of international student friends in high school and college and was really passionate about helping them adapt to getting into the American schools. Um, and having heard what international education is like from the students' perspective, I've always wondered what it's like for the administrators. So thank you guys for submitting that via the chat. Um, so the next question is from Kelsey, and she asks, what type of opportunities are there in the field of international education? I'll, I'll jump into that one. So there's such a wonderful variety of careers that you can have in international education, and perhaps the best place to go to get more information about all those different paths is our professional organization, which is called NAFSA, N-A-F-S-A. It used to stand for National Association of Foreign Student Advisors. Now it's just, just NAFSA, Association of International Educators. And if you look at their information, you'll see that there are opportunities to work with international students, like Tyler and I do. There's opportunities to work with international faculty and staff. So we have an international scholar advisor in our office who does the work visas and green cards for the international faculty or staff that the university hires to come and teach or do research here. So that's another path. Um, there are folks who do study abroad, of course. Tyler and I do the import, <laughs> and study abroad is the export side. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who like to go into the study abroad side. There's also a, a large area for folks who want to teach English as a second language. So that's another um, big part of international education. Um, there's folks who work with agreements, um, kind of the more strategic part of it where you're helping facilitate um, all types of research, exchange, any type of um, student mobility or agreements between an institution and a foreign institution. Um, gosh, Tyler, what am I forgetting? Oh, admissions. Absolutely admissions. So there's a whole lot of people that um, work in admissions offices who have to know about the unique um, secondary and uh, university credentials that that international students bring to that admissions process. So how does a degree from an institution in the Ivory Coast equate to a U.S. degree? And what kind of credit do you give that student when they're wanting to come to your university? So that's kind of fun too. And along that same lines, there are folks who do international student recruitment within the admissions offices. So we also have that as a career path. I missed anything, Tyler? I think that generally covers it. Yeah. So I think that's that's the most of it. Which is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that either um, when I started working in the international office. Uh, so the next question um, is from Taylor. And she asks, what are some of the biggest problems you have to address for international students that you might not have expected? Oh, um, there's a lot. I think um, anytime you have a student who gets in trouble, um, even though you know that can happen, it's always a shock. So um, it frequently comes up that international students um, get caught plagiarizing 
So as much as we try to warn them about the differences in instructional style and differences in cultural perception of <laughs> what is your own individual work and how you do group projects, um, there are still students who just don't understand that fully and um, get into big problems at the university because of plagiarism. So that's one issue. Um, when an international student um, has a DUI or gets drunk and has to go to the hospital, um, there are all sorts of implications down the road that make that situation much bigger than it would be for a domestic student. And so that's always a challenge. Um, Mental health problems uh, and, and challenges seem to be more common these days for international students and um, that's something that we're having to deal with on a more frequent basis is making sure that students know the support available and how to get access to it. So um, that's one. And then uh, there's always the challenge that never goes away but how do you get how do you encourage international students to break out of just their own little group? You know, at a big university like this that has 2,000 international students, there's a lot of students from Korea, there's a lot of students from China, there's a lot of students from Nigeria. How do you make sure that the Koreans interact and learn from and get to be friends with other students beyond just other Koreans? You know, and so that's a, a wonderful challenge is to try to develop programs and events that force them to get out of their comfort zone and really make friends that will expand their experience on campus. What else, Tom? I think that perhaps one of the problems that I wasn't quite as aware of when I first started was, you know, the, the desire to, to work in the U.S. is a central concern for a lot of our international students. And so um, navigating the complexities of that um, and helping students understand what is permitted and what is um, forbidden in their status, um, I think that that can be a challenge. Um, another difficulty is, you know, we interact with a lot of um, government agencies and larger organizations, um, some of which are not always easy to interact with or forthcoming with information. Um, and so, that you know, that's that's difficult for us, you know, when we're, you know fully immersed in the, in the American system and the American immigration system and are speaking the same language. Um, and so I, I know that it's even more difficult for our students who may not be as, as familiar with how the system works or how to um, go about requesting a benefit or dealing with a problem if a, a request um, doesn't go exactly as, as they've anticipated. And so ne negotiating those, those difficulties with international or with um, government agencies I think is it's also something that I just didn't, I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And whatever problems or challenges that happen around the world, they impact your students, which is, again, one of the wonderful things about our job is that the world comes to us, you know, and, and um, our students reflect everything that's going on out there. But that also means that when the banks in Nigeria shut down and, and don't want to release any funds because of the, the downturn in oil prices and our students can't get the money to go to school, you know, and you've got to help them navigate that. That's certainly been the case for a long time with Venezuela. Or when students from Nepal, um, you know, the, was it the earthquake that happened last year and students couldn't get in touch with their family members for days and were panicking about what had happened to their loved ones. You know, we, they come and talk to us and we share their, their fears and worries. And so um, it's wonderful to be able to be in that space with the student and, and to try to help in any way. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, heartbreaking at the same time. Did we cover most of this? And at any point, ETAs, if you have any follow-up questions, just feel free to interject. And if not, I will continue with the next question. <laughs> okay, so the next question uh, is from Kristen, and she asked, what is it 
like working with international students versus regular students? And uh, what kind of work do you do as an advisor and as a doctor? Sure. Start with that one. So this is so fun for me, the difference between domestic and international students. Um, the international students are so grateful for all the help that you give them and the way that they show that is just so uh, gratifying and so wonderful and, and it's partly what makes you just love your job. They'll send little thank you notes or emails or bring back some little souvenir from their home country, maybe a student you haven't seen in two years that comes by just to tell you that they've gotten married and, and you helped them so much and how thankful they are. And, um, so those expressions of gratitude that aren't as common with domestic students um, are part of what I think makes our job so special. And then also the, uh, the um, international students typically aren't as worried about looking cool <laughs> as domestic students. So they can have a really good time. So when we have our big party for new international students in the fall, We've got 300 international students out there playing limbo and musical chairs and all of these games that no American student would be caught dead doing. <laughs> Yet the international students are just out there playing it with gusto or when we had all those students doing, what was it? What silly dance was, not silly dance, but um, I forget what line dance or the nay nay or something like that. I mean, women with their head covered and <laughs> um, out there doing these really wild dances. They're just so fun. They're just so fun and so eager to jump in and learn and, and meet friends. You know, it's, it's um, a pleasure to be able to, um, to help facilitate some of those things and they're very open to it if you give them the opportunity. So that, I think that's a difference. Sometimes American students are more resistant to, to join in, I've seen. Do you have any? I think that, you know, on the, perhaps on the more mundane side, you know, the one of the central differences, I, I would say, between our international students and the regular students is that you know, international students just have a whole, a whole world of, you know, regulations and limitations mm -hmm. and requirements that they have to um, be cognizant of. That, internet, that a regular student in the U.S. doesn't, you know. Um, if you're a regular student and you decide, I don't like this class, it's not really what I wanted, I just am not going to be a full-time student this semester, I'm just going to drop it, that's fine. You're a regular student, you're, it doesn't, there's nothing else riding on that except your own education. Whereas for international students, if you do that, that you know, you, if you fall under full-time enrollment, you could lose your status in the U.S. You know, you're here to be a student. If you're not pursuing that full-time, then you're not meeting your immigration obligations. Um, and I think that a lot of times that's one of the challenges for our students is that, you know, in addition to balancing all the university requirements, um, they're also having to balance their immigration requirements um, and trying to find, find the way that the two meet can be difficult. Mm -hmm. And then um, what kind of work do you do as an advisor and as a director? So um, you start off as what an advisor does. Well, so a lot of my day... I would say that my, my day generally is divided between two different types of activities. Um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm meeting with students. Uh, we have, our office has walk-in advising hours every afternoon and several mornings during the week. Um, and so during that time, students with any kind of problem, whether it be um, you know, an academic problem, an immigration problem, a, a question about work authorization, they can just come in and see either myself or one of the other advisors. And so a lot of my time is spent um, corresponding with students. Um, I do that in person during those advising hours. Also, I get a ton of emails from students asking various questions, and so I spend a lot of time interacting that way as well. Um, and then the other big activity would be processing student requests. So if a student, you know, wants to update something in their record or they're applying for some kind of work authorization, then my responsibility as an advisor is to, is to do the technical aspect of that within our systems to give them the paperwork that they need or to clean up their record in the way that is necessary. Mm -hmm. And typically advisors also would be involved in 
um, different activities, and, and we are too. It's just that right now we are so overburdened with so many students, and we need a new staff member. We need to hire one of you. <laughs> um, so we haven't been able to spend as much time doing the activities that we used to do. So there's a lot of fun to it too. Like for example, next month we will be taking about 50 international students on a five-day trip to Washington D.C. An educational trip. So that's amazing. You really get to know the students on that bus and on that trip. So that's really fun. We'll, we'll do educational trips to Savannah or the State Fair as well. Um, doing different events on campus. Well, all of this week is the International Spring Festival. So they're having a fashion show. They're having um, a food festival, um, a parade of flags all around campus. So there's some, there's some activity planning that's a part of being an advisor typically as well. Um, that's really fun. We also have um, actually another, we have four Fulbrighters in the office. We're very proud of that out of eight people right now. And so one, one of the other advisors, she actually coordinates the Fulbrighter, Fulbright students on campus. And so she organizes events for them to get together and again get to know each other and have cultural opportunities within the city. So there's that piece also that's typically part of being an advisor. Um, as a director, um, the piece that that I have, um, I, I wear lots of hats. So um, advocacy is a big piece for me. So I attend a lot of meetings to make sure that the international student perspective and their situation is represented because they typically fall into every administrative crack available. <laughs> so if there's a new policy, a new procedure, how does that Im impact international students? So that's a big part that I play. Um, also compliance, you know, like it or not, working with international students um, does involve a lot of uh, immigration compliance and making sure that the university is holding up its part of the requirements with the federal government. And so um, I work within that a lot. But what's really wonderful about that, even if you're like me and I really don't, I wouldn't consider myself a person who, who loves being a compliance person, <laughs> um, I get to work within that compliance framework to educate students to make sure that they are doing what they need to, to to achieve their academic goals within that framework, you know. And if I do my job right and educate them appropriately, make sure there's enough information on our website, in our office, that Tyler's well trained, <laughs> then the students aren't going to be bothered or hassled by these government restrictions. And so I can try to get immigration out of the way, you know. Um, so there's there's a, a lot of good about what we do, and it's not just compliance. But otherwise, um, getting to, I mean, we intersect with every single office on campus, so we don't exist within a, our own little island at all. And so part of my role, too, is to make sure that I know the director of student accounts, and I know the registrar, and I know the key players in the different academic departments. So if a student comes to me and says, comes to Tyler and says, um, I've been in my, my PhD program for nine years. They won't let me graduate. <laughs> They're trying to keep me in the lab too long. Then I know who to call to, to advocate for that student and see hey, what's going on. You know, how can we work together to help the student get on out of here and move forward in their career? You know, so I think that's where I spend a lot of time. I think one one other thing that Heather is really good at is figuring out what what kind of you know what kind of opportunities are permitted within the regulations and then making sure that you know that we protect those opportunities for students you know if they're allowed to to, to apply for this benefit or to be able to do this type of internship then she's going to make sure that that those opportunities are are presented to the student and are available um, and that we don't do anything or the, the university doesn't do anything unnecessary to, to limit those right I'll, we'll stretch a regulation as far as we can <laughs> in the best interest of the student without putting the university at risk. Thank you so much. And I, I know that we can all relate with what you're sharing about um, international students being so grateful 
because then they're just being in creative. It's just like small little things, and they'll be they'll be like, teacher, like thank you so much for just giving them like a high five or a hug. And you're like, it's just a small gesture that we always do in America. Um, but I really feel like the students really appreciate like those small things that we do for them that we don't even think like are a big deal. So the next question is from Erin, and she asked. Um, Oh, and Erin, if you have a follow-up question, you're welcome. <coughs> okay. Um, how do you foster relationship growth between yourself and your students? I mean, I think that you know, typically what what brings students into our office is a is a practical question. You know, I came to the airport and I had to stay at security for an hour. Why did that happen? Can you help me? Or I want to apply for this. Or you know. I don't. I don't. I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that I don't get dropped from my classes. It's very. It's often very routine questions. Um, but I think one of the ways that you can foster relationships in that context is, you know, ask a student how they're doing. Ask a student, you know, how you know what's been going on recently. You know, have you been enjoying the weather? Did you have a good spring break? Um, and it's usually in those those kind of just conversational elements that are, you know, what make what make the conversation make, make the interaction fun. I mean, of course, a student can come in and ask me a very Dry question. I can give them the, the answer that they need to hear, and that's the you know the interaction has has done what it, it needs to do. I provided them the information that they need to make their decision. Um, but that's you know that's not very fun for me. That's you know and I and I and I prefer to you know what's going on with the students. So uh, it's nice to see students that you know are we have you know some that are in here a lot asking all kinds of different questions, and so just be able to to have a conversation and, a, and add a little bit in the midst of. of meeting that particular need, I think, is one of the ways that you can foster relationship. And we encourage that. I don't want Tyler or the other advisors to just be speaking about immigration with their students. You know, you need to get to know the student more holistically. And in fact, a lot of what it means to be a good advisor is not just asking two or three questions, but asking more like 15 or 20 to really understand that student situation because it can be so complex that if you don't know the full picture of what's going on with that student, you can miss an opportunity or you can miss something and, and um, cause a lot more problems than, um, than you expect. So asking lots of questions, getting to know their full situation, um, if, if they have kids, if they're married, I always try to ask them about them later on. So um, I also, if I had time when I was an advisor, and they're from some country I didn't know much about, I would ask, because I love historical fiction, what's a book that they would recommend about their part of the world? You know, some, some novel I could read that was set in their country um, that would educate me more about where they're from. And, oh, I've read some wonderful books. Um, and sometimes they've just brought them in. You know, they'll go buy them and then bring them into me the next day because they're so proud to share their culture and their country with me. So that's been a, a really fun way to get to know them too. And the next question um, is from Kathleen. Could you describe a typical work day? Yeah, I think that um, part of that was covered in that previous question. So I mean, my mm -hmm. Generally, work days are um, between, divided between interacting with students directly and then kind of doing things on the back end. You know, we have every week we have two office meetings. You know, that kind of discuss the the issues that we've seen. You know, if I have noticed that three students have come in with the same problem, then you know we get together and we say, you know, what's what's been happening here? How can we let's just all be aware that this has been an issue? And you know, have you? You know, let's kind of figure out how we as an office want to approach it. Um, but yeah, I think that it's a lot. My time is generally divided between um, interacting with students directly and then processing requests and corresponding via email. Um, with you know, the case, sometimes with the, going to events or going to meetings um, mm -hmm. here and there as they arise. Also, you know, there's lots of opportunities to increase your knowledge in various areas where. You can get it going to one of the three main conferences a year for our group um, at the state level, the regional level, or the national. So there's definitely um, conferences that you would be expected to go to because you 
that's critical for our field. I mean, if you do go into the international student advising or scholar advising piece, you've got to go to conferences or else you can't keep up with all the changes in the regulations. Um, so you just have to. So going to those or even going to lectures on campus about some part of the world, you know, we encourage that or a webinar that's being put on by some group that could help inform what we do. Um, or reading the articles from the International Educator, which is the magazine from NAFSA that comes out every month, you know, or the daily emails from InsideHigherEd.com or the, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Those are great. Every morning I skim those two emails just to see, okay, what's going on in the world of higher education and is there something in here related to my area, right? And so I, I find a lot of good things and those emails every morning that I'll then share with the rest of the staff. So um, always expanding your knowledge and seeing what trends there are that could impact what we do. Awesome. Um, okay, so the next question is from Nikki. And um, it's directed towards you, Heather, is what is one of the most important experiences someone applying for a position in your office can have? Okay. Well, I want to see that someone is really passionate about being in international education. And specifically, I want to know that you want to work with international students. You know, a lot of students um, I find study abroad and then they come back and it's, it's just changed their life and they're like, oh, I've got to work and study abroad. Um, okay, that's great, but don't apply for one of my positions just because you think it's, you know, second best. <laughs> I, I want to hear why you're really passionate about international students and how you want to help. So I want to hear about how you have had some experience with international students and how, um, how you care, you know, that, that's really critical. So typically for an entry-level position, you know, if you look around the country, um, some people will hire folks, it's pretty common to hire folks with a bachelor's and some sort of experience. Um, here, we're very fortunate to be in Atlanta. There's a lot of applicants for those positions, and we typically end up hiring people with master's degrees for the advisor positions. I think everybody in the office has a master's degree. And so um, I think that's really helpful when you work at an institution where the majority of our international students are graduate students themselves. So being able to fully understand that graduate student experience I find very helpful. And it's also great to have the different sets of knowledge that those degree programs bring. So Tyler brings his theology degree and asks a lot of great questions and has an interesting perspective because of that. Um, Brett's got experience in applied linguistics and Daphne too. Um, I forget what calories I think is in uh, business in some way. Um, so everybody had, I've got higher ed and student affairs. And so I, I'm bringing all these student development theories to the table. So it's kind of fun to see how those special areas of knowledge can kind of collectively help what we do in the office. So um, you may need to get a master's, you may not. It just kind of depends. But wow, having full right on your resume, uh, being an ETA is just a huge bonus. <laughs> it's going to get you in the door um, for I would think any position that you apply for because the traits that people associate with doing what you're doing are so positive, especially for our field, that I think it's a, a huge benefit and I think um, you'll do very well when you put yourself out there for these types of positions, whether or not you have a master's. Um, so. I would be all about, I mean, clearly four of us <laughs> have full right experience. So, I mean, it's, it's a great thing to, to have on your resume if you're going into this field. Oh, language skills, too. But you all have those. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm just curious, out of the ETAs that are tuned on this call, who has their master's degree? Okay, so Nikki and Kelsey. Mm -hmm. And Tyler didn't say this, but I was trying to push him to. I'm sure that having Fulbright on your resume is going to get you into a master's degree if you're looking to do, go back home and, and um, apply for master's programs. I would think that that's really going to bump your application up to the front um, and hopefully get you a scholarship as well. I know that for me, um, coming back from Peace Corps, I got a full ride on my master's program pretty much because I had Peace Corps on my resume. Um, and I would think the same would be true for you having the ETA experience on there. So um, it should be <laughs> a great thing to help with that process if you choose to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that <laughs> I was able to get a really generous scholarship when I See? went to my master's <laughs> program. So, uh, so that's I, I do think that having Fulbright on there was a, a very a very important part of my application. Let me tell you, those scholarships are important. Yes, yeah, that is true. Absolutely. They they put bread on that table. Let me tell you. <laughs> no doubt. Tyler, you're holding out on us. <laughs> No problem. Um, so the, now I'm going to go to the second questions that the ETA submitted because um, we've gone through so much in like 45 minutes. This is awesome. Um, so the second question from Taylor is, in your experience, how does recruiting international students at American public universities work? For example, is recruiting a certain number of international students from a particular background part of a university's goal? Well, I'm probably more the, the admissions person here, so I'll jump into that. You know, it depends. Up until maybe three years ago, Georgia State was just very passive about international student recruitment, and whoever applied, great. You know, we'd be happy with that. But in the past three or four years, we've gotten um, much more proactive about really trying to recruit international students and yes from certain parts of the world but part of it is being able to use data and see where you currently have students coming from and how can you maximize that and build upon that or looking at the data from across the US what countries are sending more international students and why are those countries not represented here at Georgia State like there's a big scholarship program for students from Oman and lots of universities across the country have major student representation from Oman, and we don't have any here. I'm wondering why not? You know, what am I not doing to attract Omani students? So, um, part of it is: is there a certain strategic goal of the university to attract students from some part of the world? Here, we have these. Five, five, five countries that we're focusing on as a university to do research um, and have uh, exchange with. So China, Korea, South, uh, South Africa, Brazil, and Turkey. And so those are areas where we're trying to recruit international students from. But for example, South Africa, it's really just not possible. So then we're looking at the data. Okay, we know that, for example, Korea sends the most undergraduates to Georgia State. Why is that? I think it's because of the large Korean American population in Atlanta, the large immigrant population that we're fortunate to have here. They all have cousins abroad <laughs> that um, they encourage to come to Atlanta and, and Georgia State. So how can we build upon that? So that's, I think there are questions like that that institutions around the country ask when they're thinking about how to recruit international students and which countries um, should we focus on. So with that, um, this wasn't really a question, but that kind of just makes me think about like how to prepare for interviews. So to know like Georgia State has those task countries. So is there any specific advice that you guys have um, when ETAs are looking into the job applications or into the interview process, whether it is their alma mater or somewhere that they're not an alum at? Yeah, I would, I would say that one of the you know, most effective ways is just 
reviewing the website of whatever office it is that you're applying to. In our office, we, you know, every year we have to run a report called the Open Doors Report that is an analysis of all of the students that we have here that are inter international students and where, they, where they've come from, what their home country is, what they're studying, you know, what their, their level is, and all that information we post on our website. So it's publicly available. So, I mean, if you, if you are curious, you know, or at least prior to my interview at Georgia State, I went and looked over that information. You know, I saw, hey, Georgia State has more international graduate students than undergraduates. So that's interesting. You know, look for trends. I think that just at least having, you know, there's obviously not an expectation to be fully immersed in that information, but to have at least a, a general awareness of what the kind of the composition of the the international student life of the university is like, or you know, the, there is information about the task force countries mm -hmm. at the Georgia State website, and so I knew that there, I knew that those five were important. Um, and then, even if you don't know all of the all of the information about those, just being aware that 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 is an aspect, you can ask good questions. And I think part of the interview uh, process is not simply giving good answers, but being able to ask informed questions. You know, to be so to be able to say. You know, I noticed that most of the students at Georgia State, international students, are graduate students. You know, can you tell me a little bit more about that, or how do you think that, you know, changes the types of questions or types of interactions that you have? And I think that that, that that's a, a good way, just using that using that information that's publicly available on their websites. Because the open doors information for the whole country is available online. Um, it's it's the Institute of International Education that that gathers that data from every college and university across the country every year. And so if you go online and just Google Open Doors Report, you can see that and that it'll tell you what the trends are for each year. So for example, the number of undergraduate Chinese students who are coming to the U.S. continues to just mushroom, but not here at Georgia State. So if you were looking at that national Open Doors data, then you can compare it to the institution you're applying to and ask some really good questions. You know, Heather, why aren't you getting an increase in undergraduate Chinese students like other institutions across the country? Wow, well, that's a very insightful question, let me tell you. You know, and I can give you lots of details there. Or if you look at our Open Doors data versus the general um, national data, um, you'll see that we have a really bizarrely large number of students from the Ivory Coast. So I've had several applicants in the interview ask me, Heather, you know why? I saw on your Open Doors information that you've got 50 students from the Ivory Coast. <laughs> why is that? What's the connection to Georgia State? So then again, that tells me, oh, they're really looking at the data. They noticed something interesting there. Um, I think that would be really impressive. Yeah. You know, Heather also mentioned a couple websites earlier that I think are, are good websites just to be aware of and to maybe keep an eye on. You know, um, Inside Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed um, is an important one. NAFSA just generally has all kinds of resources. Um, and she mentioned The Chronicle, um, which is a, a publication on kind of just news in, in higher education. Yeah, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Mm -hmm. And so um, looking up, just being familiar, kind of glancing through the the headlines and those, I think, um, can be really helpful just to kind of spot trends and or maybe see something that's interesting. And I'll say too that if you really are wanting to get into the international student side of international education, you know how I talked about, I want to know that you're passionate about the international student side. <laughs> you know, how, how can you convince me that you are? Easy, by signing up for and completing a NAFSA workshop on F1 regulations for beginners <laughs> or international student advising. So I know that when I was in your shoes and I was um, finishing up graduate school and, and, and about to put myself on the job market, there were two things that I went out of my way to do that I think really helped me. And one was I signed up for a NASA uh, workshop, I think it's a standalone but it was on international student advising, just kind of a general overview about that. And yes, it'll cost you about three or $400, but having that certification on your resume tells folks, I'm serious. I'm trying to learn about this field and about this profession. 
And then also, I found out where my local regional NASA conference was and signed up to attend that. And I knew that I wanted to be in the southeast, but I was up in Ohio in grad school. So um, I drove all the way down to Hilton Head, North Carolina, to go to that regional conference. And the student registration for these regional conferences is nothing. I think it was like $10. <laughs> so um, I know we keep it very, very cheap for students because we want you to attend those regional conferences. And wow, the connections that I made that helped me in my job search. So the networking that happens at those regional conferences is fantastic. And NAFSAMs are so nice. You know, we all love what we do. We've all got stories. You wouldn't believe how many full writers there are that are in international education. You wouldn't believe how many Peace Corps volunteers there are or how many people have studied abroad or lived abroad or worked abroad in some way. And you get us all together and we find these common grounds and we start telling stories and wow, are they fun. So it's like you found your people, you know? <laughs> so it's really easy to network and make connections at those conferences and I think it's a lot easier at the regional level which you know they're not as large you're talking anywhere from three to eight hundred people versus eight to ten thousand at the National NASA conference. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Uh, Miss, I want to make sure I pronounce your name right. Miss Housley? Housley. Housley, I'm sorry. Miss Housley. Over. Now, are those, are those workshops, do you know if they're available online? Because obviously for us, we cannot easily go to one of those workshops. Is there like a webinar, do you know? or? Yes, that's an excellent question. So I think in the past, like three or four years, some of them have been converted to online modules. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly the standalone in-person ones that tend to be either one day and we're talking like nine hours, you know, you emerge right. and your brain is just scrambled, but oh, it's overwhelming. Or maybe two half days. Um, so there's the in-person version, but there's also the online version that um, comes to you in modules that you can do. Once you sign up, I think it gives you access to the information for like a month or something. Mm -hmm. So I think those are really good too. I find that people that do the online ones don't necessarily retain the information as well as you do for the in-person ones, but it's going to look great on your resume. It's going to speak to your commitment to doing this job, um, no matter if it's online or in-person. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. And ETAs, we have about four more of about four more minutes before the call officially ends because I want to be able to uh, respect Heather and Tyler's time because I know they're busy and I know we want to get some sleep but do you guys have any questions or comments that you want to share? Going on. Going All right. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like we're good. Um, I like Heather, even working in your office for six months, like I've learned a lot through through this webinar. Like I had no idea that um, people that weren't in the field could attend those conferences. I feel that's such a great opportunity for people that are interested in it. Um, and I will say from personal experiences, it's like nowadays the jobs, it's not just what you know, but it's who you know. Um, and I've been so grateful to Heather that she gave me my first job when I graduated from college. Um, and it was because I worked previously there <laughs> as an orientation leader. And I mean, like, I was supposed to get hourly pay, um, but she advocated for me to get salary. And she was really upfront with me, and she told me that it was a six-month position because at the time I didn't have my master's degree. Uh, but she allowed me to stay one extra month because I was still looking for a job. Um, so even though I know you, I feel like this has been so great for me and even for the ETAs that um, don't know you because it's so refreshing to see such passionate people like you, Heather, and Tyler just working in this field because um, this was like a breath of fresh air for me too. It's just like, whoa, <laughs> maybe I should reconsider international education. <laughs> it's a great field. It's a wonderful group of colleagues and 
I just can't tell you, I mean, all the wonderful people that have worked in this office over the years, and even though people move around and move on, when I, I see former colleagues or if I go to these conferences, oh, it's just the greatest thing. It's like going to Disney World, you know, I'm just so happy to see all my friends. I mean, really great people that are in international education and um, doing amazing things. So. Anyway, I encourage you to consider it, and if we can be of any more assistance or answer any other questions, um, Grace, I'm sure you'll share our contact information. I welcome you to email us, or maybe we'll do this hangout thing again now that I've done it. This is awesome. Um, but any way that we can help, we're happy to do so. And then, Heather, I wanted to ask, what is the position that's available now? Just I'm curious if any of the ETAs were interested in it. So we did have, I think it's already closed, but our front desk position was open um, a little while ago, so that one is already closed. But I know that um, I'm going to be having two positions open in international admissions in the next couple of months. It would be at our perimeter college, um, but one of them is going to be for an admissions counselor, which, Grace, you would know is a position that's more externally focused, so they're going to be doing a lot of recruitment, possibly overseas. They're also going to be working with the local um, high schools, with the international students that are there, because um, Perimeter College attracts a lot of refugees and asylees, and so, you know, international students who aren't on a visa, and so that's really cool. So we're going to make sure that this person is out there um, communicating with them and trying to explain the admissions process for them, as well as trying to attract true international students from overseas. So um, I'll have sort of like an international admissions processing person that I need to hire, and then also this admissions counselor that's more of a recruiter that I'll be hiring. Oh, and maybe I'll have, I hope, I'll have a scholar position opening up in about three months if I get approval for that new position. I'm hoping that, because we're just so slammed. We just have such a growing number of scholars. I need help. So hopefully I can get another position and um, have that available also. Fingers crossed, Heather. I know, I know. I think in looking for positions, two um, other helpful resources. Uh, there's a listserv called the Secusal listserv, um, which is a kind of a general higher ed, um, lists where people are posting all kinds of questions and issues and advertising for programs, but they also um, will post positions on there. And so that's one that you know I signed up for when I was looking for jobs. It's interesting just to see what kind of jobs are coming through. Um, that's a it's a vestige of an old NAFSA structure, and it's S E C U S S A dash L. So, Sakusa L, I, I don't know. It's very strange. It was for study abroad, now it's kind of general. So, I agree. That would be a good one to sign up for. And if you know what part of the country that you want to go to, um, I would look up the state version of NAFSA there. So, for example, here in Georgia, we have the Georgia Association of International Educators, GAIE. And GAIE has a listserv. And absolutely, any positions that open around the state, whether it be in study abroad, our side of the house, or international admissions, or ESL, whatever, those get posted there. And those are always free to join. So same thing with the regional listserv, actually, the regional NAFSA ones. So if you know what state you're looking to, then I would go ahead and see if you couldn't get added to the state listserv for whatever Association of International Educators there. That, that's a very good point. So that was going to be my, my second one. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so, I mean, those are free for anyone to join. And it's, I think it's really helpful because it's, it's a very targeted list of, mm -hmm. of emails. So you're, you don't have to wade through all the positions in the world on all these other websites. It'll be a, a very, I think, you'll be able to see just the, just the positions in the field that you're looking for. So. Mm -hmm. And if you can join those even now, you know, before you start looking for a job, it's interesting to see what kind of jobs are coming available and with what kind of frequency they're available and the timing in which those jobs are posted. Um, so that information could be helpful even if you're not looking for a job today. And my other advice, just last piece of advice, is that um, 
I've always been told and I've found it to be true, it's easier to get a job when you have a job. So, um, get a job at a university, um, even if it's not exactly what you wanted to do. So, um, you know, if there's a position at a front desk, you know, that you think, well, I'm going to be overqualified for this, um, but I think it would be a good launching point for me to get an advisor position. Yes, do that. Don't um, restrict yourself to just, you know, these upper positions. Go for the entry level ones and you will shine. You know, you'll, you'll quickly distinguish yourself. People will fall in love with you, see all of your great experience. Um, and all that you, all the skills you can bring to that job, and then they'll promote you to something else really quickly. So, um, I I would definitely look for those opportunities also. That was actually kind of my story here. I originally applied for what was our front desk position, um, and in that interview process, I was not given that job, but I was <laughs> told that they had another job, my current position that was mm -hmm. coming open soon, and they encouraged me to apply for that. And so it kind of that initial position was the the way I, I got. You know, mm -hmm. FaceTime and got to interact right. with people and let them know what I was interested in, and, and that's ultimately how I was able to get this position. This is the most jam packed webinar I've been in, so <laughs> <laughs> this has been so good. Um, so I will share Heather and Tyler's um, contact information with all of the ETAs, and I will send um, everyone on this webinar the recorded of the recording of this as well. Uh, but ETAs, thank you so much for tuning in and all of your great questions. And once again, Heather and Tyler, thank you so much for your great insights. And Thank you. Good luck to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Let me go ahead and end this. I have to...